Okay, so welcome to the course. And um, the course is about simulation of complex systems. And we will start with a question. And the question is the following. What characterizes complex systems? In a normal class, I would ask people to answer in uh, person. Here, I would like you to answer in the chat. So tell me in the chat, what is that characterizes complex systems? And Agnese, can you try to collect this, uh, the keywords that come up? So just think about uh, adjectives, uh, sentences. It doesn't need to be very complex. Just what do you think that characterizes a complex system? So I see that uh, answers are accumulating. Agnese, please, can you summarize them as they come? So, for example, uh, uh, can you hear me? I think so. Yes. OK. So people, uh, students are writing like um, many interacting parts characterizes complex system or complexity, many interacting variable. And uh, the sum of the system part is more complex than the parts themselves. Uh, and um, hard to predict or unpredictable emergent uh, from basic rules, uh, many degrees of freedom, large number of interactive parts, unpredictable even if deterministic, deterministic, sorry. Um, yeah, so many parts. Okay, yeah. so we have a good array of answers which are actually all correct. And here I give you a cloud, word cloud of uh, words that come up often when we speak of a complex system. You see that we really have a lot of uh, keywords. So there are uh, many of them came up uh, from you. So interacting systems, things that are chaotic, that are too complex, that are still deterministic or made by so many parts that they are too complex to describe easily. So you have an intuitive idea of what a complex system is. Let's go to the next question. What defines complex systems? How can we define complex systems? Here I would like you more, uh, I mean of course in the optic, in the framework of this course, you should think about this question. And the answer I would like to have, try to get a sentence that defines, captures the idea of a complex system. Again, please try to write it in the chat. And I will ask again Agnese to be so kind to read up, summarize these answers. So it's a slightly more complex task now. Try to come up with the definition of complex systems. Anyone? Anyone dares to give a definition? And yes, when the sample yeah. answers are yes. split with them. Yes, so there is one saying um, the sum of the system part is more complex than the parts themselves. Okay, that's a very good point. You want or, complexing that emerges, emerges from the system. Another is a system whose behavior reflects the collective interaction rather than individual behaviors. Nice, again, the idea of interacting parts that uh, create complexity. And then sensitive dependence on initial conditions or a system with multiple agents interconnected in multiple ways, mm -hmm. a set of many com components interacting between themselves. Um, okay, so uh, these are yeah. all very good answers. And uh, let me go to one definition. And the definition is the following, a system constituted by many interacting parts that display emergent behavior. And here you see that you came up with all the keywords that make this definition 
work. So the first one is many. So you have a lot of parts that interact together. It's not, obviously a complex system is not made by a single object. It's many parts interacting together. And interacting, you also came up with the keyword interacting. So this part must interact, must not just be present. Just to give you a, a, a very simple example. Well, can you think of an example? Again, write it in the chat of a complex, of a system made of many parts, but which is not complex because the parts don't interact with each other. Can you think of anything? If any of you has a background in physics, it should be easy to think of this kind of system. Exactly, ideal gas. An ideal gas is a system made of many, by definition, non-interacting molecules or atoms, well, molecules in the gas. And, well, people can study it exactly because they're not interacting. So that's an, the typical example, very good. Okay. And finally, you also came up with the keyword emerging. So we don't just want many parts interacting with each other. We want many parts that interact in such a way that new behaviors emerge. What does it mean emerge? It means that these behaviors are not obvious uh, when the system, well, for a system that is, uh, for a simple system. So. You cannot guess what a lot of parts will do together when they interact. Uh, yeah, you cannot uh, predict it from the properties of the single, uh, single elements of the system. Again, can you come up with a counter example? Yes, and yes. There is uh, one question. Uh, what, it is, uh, what is the definition of interaction? What means uh, interacting okay. okay that's a good question interactions means uh, it's very it's not very specifically defined so it can mean many things depending on the system we have under uh, study interacting at the very least means that two elements of this complex system can come together and do something that they will not do alone and it can be anything it can be from uh, a simple interaction where two particles are just pushed away when they collide to something much more complex, like in a social or a biological system. So it's very not well defined at this point, but we will see it more specifically in the following examples. Okay, at this point I would like to ask you, can you think of a system of many interacting parts which does not display emergent behavior? This practically seem, means a system that is complex, has a lot of parts, but these parts, uh, the overall behavior of a system, very large system is essentially predictable from the single elements that compose it. So, any answers? There are two answers, uh, a few answers. For example, one says a fabric or a pile of sand or many over string, but none of them do anything special or mm. an engine. Okay. Okay. And yeah. I mean, all of these are uh, good examples, but uh, you know, you can see the emergent part or not depending. I mean, let's take a pile of sand. It's really a complex, it's not a solved problem. People don't know even nowadays why a pile of stands stands up or falls. So they are, uh, I would um, say they are borderline, but a very trivial example that uh, you, you, you may have thought it was too trivial. Think of a crystal. A crystal is made of atoms arranged in a periodic lattice. You can predict the shape of the crystal with billions or well, actually billions of billions of billions of atoms in the order of the Avogadro number, just by the properties of the single unit cell. So you know the properties of the atom, you will know what is the periodicity of the crystal independently of how many interacting parts you have in that case. So that's an example which will not be a complex system probably, almost definitively. 
Okay, so let's go to the next question. Can I just have a question there? Yes. Yes, on the, on the uh, word emergent, because uh, when you say that the crystal is not a complex system because it does not display emergent behavior, um, does not the, the crystal properties emerge from the properties of the atoms themselves? Uh, well, in, um, in, uh, yeah, you can say it, but the point is that if I know the atom, if I take a carbon atom, I know what is the structure, the electronic structure of the atom. I know that this is tetraedical, so I can easily predict from just from this atom that this can attach to other atom, at, uh, other carbon atom forming a crystal such as a diamond, because I don't really need the, to, I mean, I can predict it just from the property of the single atom. Okay. So of course, it emerges, uh, you can say in common parlance, it emerges from the property of the atom, but emergent here means really something surprising, something you would not expect or you will not be able to predict. Okay. Okay, but it's a good point. In common, here is a very technical definition. When we speak of emergent behavior, it's really a technical term and means we find out something unexpected and which cannot be trivially predicted from the properties of the units of this system. But that's a good question. So what are some examples of complex systems? Again, please write them up in the, in the chat. And Agnese, please, I will ask you to with uh, some of them. So for example, ecosystem, ecosystems, traffic, weather, climate, flock of birds, disease spreading, and colony, stock market, brain, immune system, uh, COVID <laughs> uh, elections, yeah. uh, SIR, so um, yeah, uh, susceptible yeah. immune um, recovered uh, nervous system. Okay, so all of these are very good examples. Here I just put together some examples just to, so we can think about physical system, for example, and we can go from condensed matter. Now, here might look like a crystal, which I gave as an example of not a complex system, but you know, as long as the crystal is made of a single atom or a few atoms, it's easy to predict the properties of the crystal, but when you go to complex uh, alloys made of multiple atoms, you cannot really predict easily the properties of the alloy just by the properties of the single constituting atoms. That's why we have all metallurgic research. You might have heard, for example, graphene and uh, graphene hybridized with other substances which uh, can give you a much higher Curie temperature and so on. Some news came out a few weeks ago about that. So, you know, condensed matter is definitely a field for complex system, hydrodynamic systems, pattern forming system, computing, biophysical system, mol molecular self-assembly. All of these are complex systems. Again, defined as system made of multiple particles interacting with each other leading to emerging behavior. We can think of biological systems and uh, evolution. So food webs, ecosystem, biological evolution. And we can think about urban planning, human societies, urban planning, network uh, that you see everywhere nowadays in the world very explicitly because all of you have probably Instagram, Facebook, and so on, which are social networks, which have a complex structure. And uh, yeah, differences between different societies can emerge from different patterns of organization at uh, the un underlying patterns of organization. Economical system, you also mentioned markets, economy, and so on. And collective phenomena in, gen in general, which uh, fall in really into two different categories. Collective phenomena, which are spatial, like pattern formation, which go from uh, pattern formation, the design that you see on, uh, on uh, uh, seashells. So this one is, ex I mean, this will remind you of something, I guess. Can anyone write down what uh, this reminds them, this pattern? Oh, for example, one answer is the fractals. Exactly, 
And to be specific, this reminds you, if you, you have probably seen it, you have for sure seen it, the Sierpinski carpet, right? So that kind of fractal. And dunes also have a very specific periodicity, which is done by the uh, their properties. This is what, what I was saying. A pile of sand is not so trivial and is still not fully understood, but patterns can also happen in time. Then you have collective motions, like the motion of uh, fishes in this warming and fishes and uh, milling and other behaviors, as well as the organization of uh, uh, other species. So here you see uh, emperor penguins, which organize in very specific pattern to, well, to stay warmer, essentially. And that's not so trivial because, you know, you can say, yeah, if I want to stay warmer, I just need to stay close to other penguins. But, you know, how long will a penguin stay outside the group and how will this penguin, I mean, of course, it's always better to be inside the group. You are more covered by the, uh, protected against the wind, but not everyone can be in the center. So there are in very, very nice and interesting dynamics which emerge in that case. Okay, so these are just a list of examples, which um, serves mainly to uh, tickle your imagination. But uh, let's move to the next question. And the qu next question is, uh, what are the methods that we can employ to study complex systems? Again, please write it down in the chat. And Agnese, please again, read the what you selection. So simulation, modeling, approximations. Sure. And uh, being more concrete, what kind of simulations and modeling and approximation you think man, one could uh, think about? And answers are, for example, agent-based modeling, Monte Carlo simulations, differential equations. Okay. Statistical modeling. Yes, something else. I'm sure that at least a few more usually always come up. You probably have already seen them. What else can you use? What other kind of techniques? Finite elements or chaos theory, numerical methods. Sure. All of these are uh, methods that can be employed in the study of complex systems. Here I give you a brief overview. Most of them you already come up with. So I will uh, just focus on the ones, uh, well, you know, lattice and networks. This is an extremely important area. So understanding a complex system as a network of nodes and edges and their interactions. You already said differential equation, which are used to describe uh, uh, dynamical systems. Cellular automata are extremely powerful uh, then scaling and criticality are in very, very powerful tools to understand complex systems because they permit you to understand the underlying dynamics that underlie a complex system. Uh, there are many, many nice uh, works about this. And uh, for example, you know, you can understand a lot of things by scaling behavior, like for example, uh, how does the weight of an animal scales uh, with the length of the life of that animal. There is a spe very specific scaling. So all of this can be understood in these terms. Game theory is very powerful. Yes, uh, okay. That's exactly what I was thinking about. Geoffrey West book, it's a wonderful book. And uh, all of you, which I think is titled Scale, right? And uh, I advise you all to read it. It's a bit long, but uh, speaks about uh, exactly these topics. Very nice book. And Geoffrey West is the, it's not just a science, uh, science writer. He's actually someone that has been working in that field and started that field, uh, has been working on that for 30 years. One of the most curious thing in that book is, for example, the scaling. The funny thing is that, and you can notice yourself, I guess no, most of you have not always lived in the same city. And if you have a very simple step counter, like on your phone, which counts a step, you will notice that the number of steps you make in average per day scales with a very specific exponent as a function of the size of the city where you are. So the same person in a small village will make less steps than that person. So someone in, I don't know, 
who lives in a very small village with 10,000 people will make many less steps than someone who lives in a large city with 10 million people. And this is a very specific scaling, which is in the order of zero, uh, 0 0.85, I think. So it's not a very strong scaling, but still, you will notice that and you can test it yourself if you move from a small village to a big city. Anyway, interesting stuff. So information theory is very important and permits to understand how information moves from, uh, yeah, how information can affect physical systems. It's an extremely interesting field. Computational complexity always plays a role and agent-based modeling, of course, was mentioned already. Okay, so now next question, which might be a bit less expected, and is why do we want to use simulations? And here I would really like to see some, uh, yeah, what, what do you think? Why simulations are uh, so useful? Why do we want to use simulations? Uh, one uh, answer is uh, prediction, so to predict the result, or uh, is cheaper to compute than a complete modeling and easier uh, simulation than measure. Mm -hmm. Ooh, a lot of answers easier. just Please um, summarize them, obviously. You don't need yeah, to yeah, yeah, yeah. No analytical solution possible or hard to find, uh, we can predict with simulation. Oh, no deterministic solution and modeling and hitting go button is the easiest way. Well, <laughs> uh, so here we see a lot of uh, good answers and um, you see that- Avoid theoretical calculations, control the environment, time efficient. Okay. So a lot of you focus on the fact that uh, simulation can be efficient, simulation can address problems that cannot be otherwise solved, and, uh, and uh, that you can uh, understand better interaction with an environment. So one of the main reasons why we want to use simulations is obviously because a lot of systems can simply not be solved otherwise. So we cannot necessarily understand and solve a system which is uh, very complex. We don't have an analytical solution. And I like usually to put this into an uh, historical perspective because this puts simulation, I mean, many of you, also from the, uh, your answers, I can see that there is some kind of subordination of simulation to analytical solutions. So we use simulations when we don't have an, an analytical solution. And that's only partially true. And that's why I like to put things in an historical perspective. And when I say historical perspective, what I mean is that in different ages, people have tried to understand the world using different tools. And the tools that I've used to try to understand the world have both limited and defined the kind of uh, uh, the problems that they were interested in and the kind of solutions that they accepted. So let's go back a few thousand years and we can think of geometry. So you might know from ancient Greece, maybe from, uh, I guess you studied history and philosophy in uh, high school, I guess. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, but anyway, in ancient Greece, geometry was really the king. So the understanding of physics and mathematics was built on geometry. Why? Essentially because people could draw geometry on the sand or on tablets and speak about it. You all know, for example, that it was an extreme, well, I guess all of you have heard of it. Uh, there was a huge problem for Pythagoreans, right? Pythagoras had a huge problem, which was uh, really shattering his worldview. What was the problem Pythagoras had? The square root of two, that's correct. And why? It's an irrational number. And by the way, think of the word irrational. An irrational number, an irrational person gives you an idea that they really didn't want those numbers. <laughs> Just the name. Yes, what's the problem? He had no solution. That's exactly the word within a geometric thinking of the world. If you think of your world as made of objects that are 
particles with the unit length, well, then if you construct the size of something with atoms and you want to construct the diagonal, well, you have to use a certain number of atoms for constructing the, the atom. Think grain of sands. That's why the degree came up with the atom concept, by the way. So think of grain of sands. If I construct the side of a square with a grain of sands and I construct also the diagonal with grain of sands, that should be a rational number which tells me what is the ratio between the grain of sands on the diagonal and the grain of sands on the side. This was the reason. So this geometric thinking about the world was the reason why Pythagoras was so upset about finding that square root of two is not rational and tried to hide it. And the Pythagoreans tried to hide it was one of the secrets in their school of thought. By the way, the importance of geometry, this is uh, a cartoon which goes back uh, to Archimedes. You probably know Archimedes for many reasons. One of the reasons you might know Archimedes is that uh, you uh, know that he died because, well, Archimedes was in Syracuse and he was uh, uh, helping defending Syracuse, was a very important uh, scientist and philosopher. So the Romans didn't want to kill Archimedes. They wanted to have him with them. They didn't want to kill him. But the point is that he was so absorbed in studying drawing circles on the sand that a Roman uh, soldier came there and Archimedes, instead of saying, don't kill me, I'm Archimedes, said, don't disturb my circles. And then he was killed. That's the anecdote about the death of Archimedes and that's what this means. But it gives you an, import, an idea of how important is geometry and how geometry defines and limits what people can study. Just to give you an idea, you all know that, um, and probably some of you even studied the Euclidean geometry, right? And the reason is because Euclides, who defined geometry in the Greek times, wrote down some books that defined geometry, but they were so well written, so well structured in terms of theorems and so on, that people until the Middle Ages and the Renaissance didn't really think about going beyond that. So Euclides remained the bedrock of studying mathematics and physics for thousands of years, which means only geometry is what matters. Then, I like that you say in rational but constructible, that's true, but uh, what, uh, what happened then? What is the next phase? Which you are essentially absorbed in? Around the, the end of the Middle Ages, beginning of Renaissance, there was a lot of study well, non-Euclidean geometry, it's part of it, but it came a bit later, it's more like 19th century. And what is very important is that people start thinking not in terms of uh, geometry, but in terms of numbers and equations. So calculus came about. That's why we think about physics equations. And that's why, and the treaty that really pushed calculus into the mainstream was the Principia by Newton. Okay, so Principia of Newton is essentially a book that for the first time moves away from geometry and shows that we can use calculus to do real physics and to understand the world. From then on and until now, people have been thinking about calculus as the bedrock on which you must write physics and understand the world. That's why many of you were saying, well, we use simulations when we don't have an explicit formula because the focus on explicit formulas and solvable problems it's a focus that has been held following the success essentially of Newton. Newton's law, Newton's of gravitation, gravitational law of Newton, F equal ma and so on. So you see so there was a shift and this was uh, around the 1600, 1700 and definitely in 1800 from understanding mathematics and physics from uh, geometry to understanding mathematics and physics with formulas. And um, you can see that very clearly because uh, I guess all of you had in uh, the first courses of physics uh, that you studied the harmonic oscillator, what you study is really solvable models, which means models in which you can find an explicit solution, a formula, you want a formula. So you don't study the most interesting stuff necessarily, but the thing that fit within this worldview where physics and understanding of the world must be in formulas. 
Then what happened very, very recently, and this means uh, in the last uh, 20, 30 years, is that there has been now a shift going from understanding the world in terms of uh, calculus and formulas to understanding the world with simulations. So simulation have really a, a huge importance in how we understand the world and how we do physics and, uh, yeah, and engineering. Why is it so? Why is it so important? Well, essentially, by thinking about simulations, we can now understand that we can do a series of things that before we will not even consider worthy of our time. So we can understand, for example, complex systems, which before were not really the mainstream problem. So no one really look too much into complex systems simply because they were too complex to be solved analytically. So now we have a whole series of new problems that we can only solve by simulations and by analysis of, uh, of data. And um, here I would like you to think about, uh, think of examples. So can you think of any example of problems that nowadays are considered very important but were not a few years ago, simply because they could not be solved using analytical functions. So, few answers. Simulation of elections results mm -hmm. by, by sentiment analysis in internet. Predict weather, computer vision, differential equations, weather simulation, so, or traveling salesman. All very good examples. For example, okay, well, uh, elections since tomorrow, oh, no, actually today there are elections in the United States. You know, probably many of you know Nathan Silver. Do you know him? Okay, but uh, Nathan Silver is a statistician which managed uh, a few election cycles ago to basically uh, basically to predict exactly, uh, well, not exactly, but to predict the electoral results in all states in the US. That happened uh, like uh, early 2000, I guess. So in one election cycle, he managed to predict everything using statistical models informed by polling results. So basically what he got is a lot of polls and use statistical models to predict what the election results should be, and it was exactly what he predicted. He used this based on knowledge that he had accumulated by predicting uh, baseball games results. And he became very famous because of that. He wrote several books, and he's also the chief editor of the website 538.org or com, I don't remember. Maybe Agnese, you can find it and pass it in the chat, where he gives prediction about, uh, uh, well, both baseball games and uh, electoral results in the US. And it's also, it's generally very accurate in his uh, predictions. And what he does is exactly simulations. If you go now to the website, you will see that its model is based essentially, well, it's informed by the information from the polls, but what he does is to run maybe 10,000 simulations of the electoral result and calculate the probability of winning for each candidate based on that 10,000 simulations for each uh, case. So you see, that's, uh, that's very, that could be a very good example to look at today. And uh, yeah, so that's one example, but you also mentioned other cases. So for example, you might all have heard about uh, the X boson discovery a few years ago, which was a very important discovery, obviously. And you know how it worked out. Essentially, uh, well, to analyze the boson result, you have to simulate what happens when two atoms collide in, in the collider. And you simulate this and you see what happens in the detectors and then you basically, it's an inverse problem, you go from the detector to the simulation that approximates this, uh, what you observe best. So that's how you go back and you understand what happened between the two at colliding atoms. Another example of this, maybe more recent, is uh, you remember the, uh, the observation of the gravitational wave in 2015? 
it was uh, a very big uh, news, I guess, everywhere. So in the observation of the gravitational wave, again, what they did was to match the results they were observing in the detector to simulation, to a lot of simulations of the system and seeing which one were matching best. And so basically you have to make a simulation of a very complex, you don't have a formula. It's not that you have a formula that says if I observe a sinusoidal with this period, then I have a uh, gravitational wave. You have a, host, a huge amount of simulations and which tell you if you observe this, something similar to this means that most likely with probability 98% there was a gravitational wave. With this one, 99.9 .9 and so on. So you see, simulation enter to be part of the scientific process. One of the most challenging aspects of this was actually to understand, to let, well, you can guess probably, who is the last one to accept simulation as part of their scientific process? Which group of people? Can you guess? Yeah, that's correct. Mathematicians. Mathematicians are the last one to accept it. Why? Because mathematicians are build, build their proofs on an equi still going back to geometry, because the idea is that you have axioms. On these axioms, you build some construction and you get theorems, and then you can, well, verify the theorem. Done first with geometry, then with calculus. What's the problem in using simulations for this? Well, that no human can even in principle reproduce the results. So how do we know that the computer has not made a mistake in the calculation? And how do we know that uh, this is reproducible? How do we know that the code written by the mathematician that wanted to make... So basically to accept that you can write a program and this program can check all possible cases of a theorem and confirm that it's correct is something that mathematicians have not accepted until very few years ago. And even nowadays, there are lots of mathematicians that consider this not proper mathematics. But most of mathematicians will accept a computer code that checks as exhaustively all cases of a given theorem, uh, uh, yeah, using computers. But this is something extremely recent until 10 years ago, most mathematicians would have told you that's not acceptable. So you see, the shift is happening right now. Simulations are becoming an accepted part and maybe even the most important part of the scientific method and definitely of engineering. And that's why it's so important to work on simulation and to understand and to learn how to simulate complex systems. Okay, so with this, I conclude the first part of the class. Of course, now, if you have any question, you can ask me. In the meantime, I would like to ask you one more question. And essentially, uh, we need the course representatives. Actually, not one. They need to be several, like five. So if there are any volunteers, you are welcome to contact me now during the break. Uh, if not, I will uh, use, uh, I will uh, make the course representative the ones that have been suggested randomly by the school. Okay, so please let me know. You can contact me privately if you prefer or publicly as you wish. Let me know if any of you would like to be a course representative. In the meantime, we have like four minutes still of the first hour and I would like you to ask, well, I would like to ask you if there is any question. You can either write it in the chat and Agnese can, uh, will gently read it or you can uh, raise your hand and Agnese will unmute you. Uh, I have a question. I have been checking the page, web page for the course and the material and what is expected. And I saw that uh, quite early in the course, it is expected from us to define what sort of project we're going to work on and what uh, complex system we're going to simulate. Mm -hmm. And uh, it seems a bit uh, overwhelming for me to early in the project because in the course, because I have no idea uh, about uh, like uh, what is expected from us because it's uh, as you went through the complex systems or complex, mm -hmm. uh, it's not so easy to pick a topic. Yeah. And yeah. So, uh, uh, would you elaborate on it uh, in the coming days or how is it? Uh, actually, I was I, I, the second hour will be dedicated all on the structure of the course and all these issues. 
Okay. So I will, ex yeah, should have said it. So maybe you can ask me again if it's not clear at the end of the next hour. Because next hour will be fully dedicated to explain all the details about the course, how it's organized, how it's graded and everything. Okay, thank you. So maybe, yeah, let me know at the end if it's still unclear. Okay, so is there any question, any comments? Uh, if nobody has a question, I have just uh, maybe a point to make. Uh, I mean, I yeah. was wondering um, when you talked about uh, how Newton switches from um, uh, the perspective from geometric to more analytical and to ge from geometry to calculus. I was wondering, don't you think though that uh, there is a grain of geometry that remains because uh, in the end, uh, um, the coordinate system that Newton uh, uses in order for uh, for him to make prediction is still completely based on the uh, Euclidean geometry of the, the time and the, and the spatial axis always there well, in this Cartesian plane, which is... I, I didn't understand. Yes, and uh, mm, you are completely right. There is a lot of geometry that remains, even more subtly than the Cartesian plane. Uh, if you think about it, uh, geometry remains in the way in which you structure all mathematics. You know that mathematics tends to tries to be structured as uh, axioms, and building on these axioms, you have theorems. This is something that goes back actually to the uh, Euclidean approach to geometry. So the the whole idea of building mathematics as axioms and then theorems comes from the geometrical approach. And when you mention the Cartesian plane, it's very nice because it's a very good example of how geometry uh, was. Uh, I mean, Cartesian plane. Well, it's even called after Cartesio, Cartesio, who was working actually in the in exactly in the transition from a geometrical approach to physics and mathematics to an algebraic approach. So it's exactly in the middle. And so, and mm -hmm. this transition was exactly there, and it's still there. The Cartesian plane is so important for uh, the current understanding of mathematics. There are very deep connection between, for example, I'm not going to go into the details, obviously, but uh, there are very deep connection between Cartesian claim and complex numbers. Because uh, you can map complex numbers on the Cartesian plane and complex numbers were originally accepted only because, well, one of the reasons why people didn't want to accept complex numbers for a long time is because they could not have any uh, geometrical interpretation. What is square root of minus one? doesn't make any sense geometrically. Well, the Cartesian plane is- The new Pythagorean. If you want to read more about that, there is a wonderful book about complex uh, numbers using the geometrical approach, which is called the visual complex analysis. Wonderful book. I mean, technical, obviously, but what? Thank you, thank you for the answer. Uh, Giovanni? Yes. Uh, there is uh, one question if, uh, from the chat. If there is any recommended specific program, programming tool that we will use in the course. No, in the, I guess you mean by that uh, com, any programming language and the answer is no, you can choose whatever you want. But again, uh, I will explain this in mm -hmm. detail in the next uh, hour, but you can use anything you like because here it's not a programming course. We assume that you know how to program already. And uh, yeah, so we, yeah, it's up to you. Okay, good. So we will have a break now and we'll uh, reconvene at 11. If you have questions, I will be still here so you can just write to me. Okay, thank you and see you in 15 minutes.